Welcome to Bless Man Meditations. My name is Andy. On this YouTube channel, I offer thoughtful responses to skeptical objections to the Christian faith. I likewise edify the saints by equipping them to provide an answer for the hope that lies within them. I hope that you find value in my work. Please like my videos, send me comments, and please subscribe. Let's work together to contend earnestly for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. Today on Blessed Man Meditations, we continue our look through Paul Copan's Is God a Moral Monster? where we make sense of the Old Testament God, and we see that it's not as the new atheists make it out to be. These are the contents of that book. We continue our look at the Canaanites in today's episode. Here's Paul Copan, Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics at Palm Beach Atlantic University in the state of Florida. He's written or edited over 20 apologetics and philosophy books and lives in Florida with his wife and children, at least at the time of the writing of Is God a Moral Monster? Today in Is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copan, we look at chapter 16, where we look at part two of the series on the killing of the Canaanites. As we've said, as Copan has said, the Old Testament's holy wars, or more accurately, Yahweh wars, are the most emotionally charged biblical problem raised by the new atheists and by critics in general. Like it or not, war is a common feature of our fallen world. Indeed, we know that warfare was a way of life, and often warfare was a matter of survival in the ancient Near East. However, the problematic wars under Joshua, after the Torah, take place primarily during and shortly after Israel's second historical stage under Joshua, the theocratic stage of Israel's existence. As Copan has mentioned, this Yahweh warfare wasn't the standard for the other stages in Israel's history. This Yahweh warfare wasn't intended as a permanent fixture in Israel's story. Yahweh warfare was unique to Israel at a particular point in time and was not to be repeated in later history by Israel or by other nations. Without God's explicit command and his morally sufficient reasons for commanding, attacking the Canaanites would not have been justified. So it was justified because, because of God's explicit command to do so and his morally sufficient reasons to command the Canaanites to be attacked anyway. So now we're going to look at infiltration, internal struggle, and conquest. How did the Promised Land come to be inhabited by the Israelites? Biblical scholars and archaeologists continue the effort to uncover the nature of Israel's relationship to the Canaanites, and they are finding something more complex than the traditional Sunday school version of the conquest model. The bigger picture includes not just conquest, but rather a combination of other factors. Besides military engagement, some type of infiltration took place. Internal struggle was another feature. That is, Israel often did a poor job staving off idolatry and distinguishing itself from surrounding pagan lifestyles. <clears throat> Scripture's realistic acknowledgement that the Canaanites continued to live in the land suggests that something more than a military campaign, campaign took place. The books of Joshua and Judges suggest that taking the land included less than dramatic processes of infiltration and internal struggle. Israel's entrance into Canaan included more than the military motif. Old Testament scholar Gordon McConville comments on Joshua. He says, We don't have a simple conquest model, but rather a mixed picture of success and failure, sudden victory, and slow, compromised progress. That's the end of the quote by McConville. Likewise, Old Testament scholar David Howard firmly states that the conquest model needs modification. Why? Because, Howard says, quote, the stereotypical model of an all-consuming Israelite army des descending upon Canaan and destroying everything in its wake cannot be accepted, Howard says. The biblical data will not allow for this. An additional quote by Howard. Howard adds that the Israelites entered Canaan and did engage militarily, quote, but without causing extensive material destruction, end quote. Copan will come back to this significant point. Now let's look at ancient Near Eastern exaggeration rhetoric. Most Christians read Joshua's conquest stories like the backdrop of Sunday school lessons via flannel graph or children's illustrated Bible stories. The impression that is left 
is a black and white re uh, rendition of a literal crush, kill, and destroy mission. A closer look, however, at the biblical text reveals a lot more nuance and a lot less bloodshed. In short, the conquest of Canaan was far less widespread and harsh than many people, like the New Atheists, assume. Like his ancient Near Eastern contemporaries, Joshua urged the language of conventional warfare rhetoric. This language sounds like bragging and exaggeration to our ears. Notice first the sweeping language in Joshua chapter 10, verse 40. Quote, Thus Joshua struck the land, the hill country, and the Negev, and the lowland, and the slopes, and all their kings. He left no survivor, but he utterly destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. End quote. Joshua used the rhetorical bravado language of his day, asserting that all the land was captured, all the kings defeated, and all the Canaanites destroyed. Where it says that Joshua took the whole land and gave it for uh, an inheritance to Israel. That was in Joshua chapter uh, 10 and Joshua chapter 11. Yet, as we will see, Joshua himself acknowledged that this wasn't literally so. Scholars readily agree that Judges is literarily linked to Joshua. Yet the early chapters of Judges, which incidentally repeat the death of Joshua, show that the task of taking over the land was far from complete. In Judges chapter 2, verse 3, God says, I will not drive them out before you. Earlier in Judges chapter 1, it asserts that they did not drive out the Jebusites. They did not take possession. They did not drive them out completely. These nations remained to this day at the end of Joshua chapter, or Judges rather, chapter, Judges chapter 1. The people who had apparently been wiped out reappear in the story. Many Canaanite inhabitants simply stuck around. Some might accuse Joshua of being misleading or getting it wrong. But that's not what happened. He was speaking the language that everyone in his day would have understood. Rather than trying to deceive, Joshua was, was just trying to say it was just saying he had fairly well trounced the enemy. On the one hand, Joshua says there were no Anakim left in the land in Joshua chapter 11. Indeed, they were utterly destroyed in the hill country. But were they literally destroyed? Was there literally not anyone left? Well, not according to what Joshua said. In fact, Caleb later asked permission to drive out the Anakites from the hill country. Again, Joshua wasn't being deceptive. He was just using ancient Near Eastern hyperbole. Given the use of ancient Near Eastern hyperbole, Joshua could say without contradiction that the nations remain among you. Joshua went on to warn Israel not to mention swear by, serve, or bow down to their gods. Well, if they were gone, how could they have gods to be bowed down to? Again, though the land had rest from war, chapters 13 and beyond tell us that much territory remained unpossessed. Tribe upon tribe failed to drive out the Canaanites. Joshua tells seven of the tribes, How long will you put off entering to take possession of the land which the Lord your God of your fathers, Lord the God of your fathers, has given you? Furthermore, God told the Israelites that the process of driving out the Canaanites would be a gradual process, as was anticipated by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and was reaffirmed by the author of Judges in Judges chapter 2. Whatever the reason behind Israel's failure to drive out the Canaanites, whether disobedience and or God's slow but sure approach, we're still told by Joshua in sweeping terms that Israel wiped out all the Canaanites. Just as we might say that a sports team blew their opponents away or slaughtered their opponents or annihilated their opponents, the author of Joshua likewise followed the rhetoric of his day. Joshua's conventional warfare rhetoric was common in many other ancient Near Eastern military accounts in the 2nd and 1st millennia BC. The language is typically exaggerated and full of bravado, depicting total devastation. They're, they're talking it up a little bit to, uh, to give the reader a sense of their success. But the reader would know that it was not meant to be taken in a literal sense. The knowing ancient Near Eastern reader recognized this as hyperbole, what I just said. The accounts weren't understood, were not understood to be literally true. This language, Egyptologist Kenneth Kitchen observes, has misled many Old Testament scholars in their assessments of the book of Joshua. Some have concluded that the language of wholesale slaughter and total occupation, which didn't from all other indications actually take place, proves that these accounts are falsehoods. Some have concluded that these accounts are 
falsehoods. But ancient Near Eastern accounts readily used utterly or completely destroy another obliteration language even when the event didn't literally uh, happen in a way such that literal destruction or literal obliteration didn't actually take place. Here's a sampling of such other ancient Near Eastern texts that use these type of uh, this type of ancient Near Eastern exaggeration rhetoric. So first we have Egypt's Tutmosis III, who wrote in the later 15th century and boasted that the num uh, that the numerous army of Mitanni was overthrown within the hour, annihilated totally, like those now not existent. In fact, Mithiani's forces lived on to fight in the 15th and 14th centuries BC. The Hittite king Mursili II, who ruled from 1322 to 1295 BC, recorded making Mount uh, Asherpaya empty of humanity and the mountains of Tari, wow, Tarikariyumu, empty of humanity. So they're, they're using exaggerated language to show that everybody was wiped out. To say that everybody was wiped out. The Bulletin of Ramses II tells of Egypt's less than spectacular victories in Syria around 1274 BC. Nevertheless, uh, Ramses II announces that he slew the entire force of the Hittites, indeed all the chiefs of the countries, just disregarding the millions of foreigners which he had considered chaff. In the Merepta Stele, Stele, however you say that, around 1230 BC, Ramses II's son, Merenepta, announced that Israel's wasted, his seed is not, which, is, which was another premature declaration. More of the ancient Near Eastern exaggeration rhetoric, King, uh, Moab's King Misha, who ruled around 840, around 830 BC, bragged that the northern kingdom of Israel has utterly perished for always, which was over a century premature. The Assyrians devastated Israel in 722 BC. Assyrian ruler Sen Sennacherib in 701 to 681 BC used similar hyperbole when he said that the soldiers of Hyrium, uh, dangerous enemies, uh, he cut them down with a sword and he said not one escaped. You get the idea. This, this type of ancient Near Eastern exaggeration rhetoric is used a lot. Let's now return to the Old Testament text to press this point further. It's true that Joshua chapters 9 through 12 utilizes the typical ancient Near Eastern literary devices for warfare, but at the book's end, Joshua matter-of-factly assumes that the continued existence of the Canaanite peoples uh, at the near the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua matter-of-factly assumes that the Canaanites continue to exist uh, and would continue to pose a threat for Israel. He warns uh, Israel against uh, idolatry and getting entangled into the Canaanite ways. In Joshua chapter 23, verses 12 and 13, it says, quote, For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, the Canaanite nations, these which remain among you, and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you. If Israel is going to choose to continue to intermingle with the Canaanites, the Lord is going to stop being with the Israelite people in the sense of giving them victory over them. Earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we find a similar tension. On the one hand, God tells Israel that they should defeat and utterly destroy the Canaanites uh, in, a, in a holy consecration to destruction. On the other hand, in verses 3 to 5, he immediately goes on to say, nor shall, you, nor shall you make marriages with them. So if they're destroyed, how could you make marriages with them? Obviously, it was uh, utterly destroyed was, was meant to be taken as hyperbole. Uh, nor shall you make marriages with them, nor shall you give their daughter to their son or take their daughter for your son. Don't mix with them. Again, if they're completely destroyed, how can you mix with them? For they turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and, so, and destroy you suddenly. But this you shall, but thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. He wants them to make a complete religious break from the Canaanite influence so they will be wholly devoted to serve Yahweh. If the Canaanites were to be completely obliterated, why this discussion about intermarriage or treaties? Exactly. The final verse emphasizes that the ultimate issue was religious. Israel was to destroy altars, images, and sacred pillars. In other words, destroying Canaanite religion was more important than destroying Canaanite people. And so it is today for the 21st century Christian. Uh, you're, especially in America, you cannot escape the influence of the world, but you can separate from it. You cannot let it influence you. I realize that's not always easier said than done, uh, or that, that is always that is often easier said than done, 
but uh, God has given us the ability to overcome temptation. He's provided a way of escape whenever we're tempted. He's given us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, to give us a hatred for the things that are unholy and a love for the things that are holy. Um, this point uh, about destroying Canaanite religion was more important than destroying uh, Canaanite people was made earlier in Exodus chapter 34, where it says, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest it be a snare in your midst, but you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. That's Exodus chapter 34, verses 12 and 13. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we read the same emphasis on destroying Canaanite religion. It says, quote, You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills, and under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. Again, the emphasis is on destroying Canaanite religion. They, uh, in order for the religion to be set up, the people who practice the religion must be in existence. So they could not have been completely annihilated or obliterated because otherwise their influence would be removed. I can't imagine that Israel would destroy the people but allow the people's artifacts to remain. That just doesn't make sense. As Gary Millar writes, the concern of this destruction was to see Israel established in a land purged of Canaanite idolatry as painlessly as possible. And you see in the New Testament, you see um, this principle uh, this principle, especially in the New Testament of Paul's epistles, you see this principle repeated, where after Paul's laid the doctrinal foundation for for Christianity and the gospel, you see the uh, you see that now that you are a new creation in Christ, here's how you should live. Uh, now that there is no condemnation in Christ, here's how you should conduct yourself. Uh, now that Christ has has uh, become the author and finisher of your faith, here's how you should conduct yourself. And so, so that this, this Old Testament principle is carried on into the New Testament where God's people are to be separate from the world. Uh, the goal was to remove what is subject uh, to laws, the idols. The root of the dilemma Israel faced wasn't the people themselves, but their idolatrous way of life. And that's what the Christian finds themselves up against today. The, uh, Charles, I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who said that the human heart is an idol factory. And um, we have to work hard with the Holy Spirit's help to overcome our propensity to idolatry. And with God's help, we can achieve that, albeit not to a point of sinless perfection in this life, but with the Holy Spirit's help um, and Jesus who has overcome the world, he allows his people to be overcomers. Failure to remove idolatry would put Israel, would put the, the Christian today in the position of the Canaanites and their idols before God. If, if we don't ad adequately remove idols from our lives, we can fall into the same uh, trap of idol worshipers in generations past. Israel would risk being consecrated to destruction. Even so, the Israelites didn't do an effective job removing the snare of idolatry from the land. Many of the Canaanites, as already noted, were still around until this day, and many of them became forced laborers in Israel. So they weren't, they weren't annihilated, obliterated, all killed. Now we're going to look at the Amalekites. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we encounter the remaining set of destruction references, reserved for an enemy hell-bent on Israel's annihilation. Here, God tells Saul to utterly destroy and not spare the Amalekites, to put to death both man, woman, child, and infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. By the end of 1 Samuel 15, Saul has apparently killed all the Amalekites except King Agag, and he has spared lots of the livestock of the Amalekites. Saul didn't fully obey God, and the prophet Samuel had to step in and finish off Agag himself. Because Saul didn't carry out God's command completely, God rejected Saul as king. As with the stories in Joshua, the, surf, the surface reading here is that Saul wiped out all the Amalekites. Copan will come back to this point, but first let's ask, who were the Amalekites? The Amalekites were nomadic people. They were Israel's enemies from day one after Israel crossed the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 17. Israel was weary and unprepared to fight, 
and they, fear, they faced a fierce people who showed no concern for the vulnerable Israelite population. The Amalekites were relentless in their aim to destroy Israel, and they continued to be a thorn in Israel's side for generations, as the book of Judges records. Again, 1 Samuel chapter 15 appears to be a clear-cut case of a complete obliteration. It appears to say that there are no Amalekites remaining, but this just isn't so. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 27, we see where it says in verse 8 of 1 Samuel 27 that David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the utterly destroyed Amalekites. Well, if they were previously utterly destroyed, well, how could David go up and raid them? But that was, but was that the end of them? No, because they appear again in 1 Samuel 30. The Amalekites made one of their infamous raids in 1 Samuel 30, and David pursued them to get back the Israelites and the booty that the Amalekites had taken. And 400 of the Amalekites had escaped. So, contrary to the common impression, Saul did not wipe out all the Amalekites, something 1 Samuel makes clear. And even David didn't complete the job. The Amalekites were still around during King Hezekiah's time 250 years later, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Then we get to the time of Esther, when the Jews were under the rule of the Persian king Ahasuerus, or King Xerxes, from 486 to 465 BC. Here we encounter Haman the Agagite. He was the, um, he was the primary enemy in the book of Esther. It was his goal to destroy Israel. Remember King Agag the Amalekite from 1 Samuel chapter 15? Yes, Haman was an Amalekite who continued the Amalekite tradition of aggression against God's people. Well, how could Haman have been alive if, uh, if they had all been wiped out? An enemy of the Jews, Haman mounted a mil uh, campaign to destroy the Jews as a people. Knowing that callous Amalekite hostility would continue for nearly a millennium of Israel's history, God reminded his people not to let up in their opposition to the Amalekites. Otherwise, the hardened Amalekites would seek to destroy Israel. If the Amalekites had their way, Israel would have been wiped off the map. Unlike other Canaanites, the Amalekites just couldn't be assimilated into Israel. So what's the moral of the story? Don't simply adopt the surface reading about Saul utterly destroying the Amalekites. When we read phrases like the destruction of everything that breathes, breathes more should, or excuse me, we should be more guarded. In fact, for all we know, and based on what we've seen in Joshua and what we'll see following, Saul could well have been engaging combatants in battle rather than not non-combatants. He could have been fighting with other uh, enemy soldiers instead of um, civilians. The city of, of Amalek was probably a fortified, perhaps semi-permanent military encampment. Yes, decisive defeat is certainly in view, but something more is going on here. Copan will continue to explore this uh, as we go on. One more related point, however, the term harem, uh, which means ban or consecrated to destruction, the the harem language connected with Israel's warring against other warring against other nations first focuses on the Canaanites. The second cluster of this term, this harem warfare, focuses on the Amalekites. Uh, in 1 Samuel 15, it focuses on the Amalekites. The use of harem for the conquest period with its additional application to Israel's long-standing Amalekite enemies indicates the language is restricted. The language is not applied to Israel's warfare with other nations, nor do Israel's holy wars with other nations go beyond this limited time period. What about men, women, and children? Old Testament scholar Richard Hess has written a great detail, is, is written, Hess has written in great detail about the Canaanite question, and he offers further important insights on this topic. Hess argues persuasively that the Canaanites targeted for destruction were political leaders and their armies rather than non-combatants. So he's saying that in the Old Testament, Israel went after the political leaders and, and the armies, not the civilians. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 20 mentions the ban or dedication to destruction which refers to complete destruction of all warriors in battle rather than non-combatants. However, doesn't Joshua 6.21 mention the ban, every living thing in it, in connection with men and women, young and old, ox and sheep and donkeys? This stock phrase, men and women, occurs seven times in the Old Testament in connection with Ai, Amalek, Saul at Nob, Jerusalem during Ezra's time, and Israel. Each time, except at Nob, where Saul killed the entire priestly family except one, the word all is used. 
The same idea applies to earlier passages in Deuteronomy, for instance, where it says, We captured all the cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men, women, and children in every city. We left no survivor in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 3, it says, Utterly destroying men, women, and children of every city. The expression men and women or similar phrases appear to be stereotypical for describing all the inhabitants of a town or region without predisposing the reader to assume anything further about their ages or even their genders. This becomes clear in the next section. Let's remember that mercy is always available to any Canaanite who responded positively to the God of Israel. So again, uh, even though you have this warfare language going on, if any Canaanite humbled themselves and turned from their false gods to the God of Israel, uh, Israel, God would have Israel be merciful to them. They could embrace Israel, Israelite religion and, uh, and stop the idolatrous Canaanite practices, and they would not have to be uh, dealt with harshly. Although the ban was applied in specific settings, this doesn't preclude the possibility of sparing people like Rahab and her relatives. The ban allowed and hoped for exceptions. Now let's look at Jericho, Ai, and other Canaanite cities. Joshua's language concerning Jericho and Ai appears harsh at first glance. Joshua 6.21, it says, They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys, end quote. Uh, then in um, Joshua 8.25, it says, 12,000 men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai, end quote. The average person isn't going to pick up on the fact that the stereotypical ancient Near Eastern language actually describes on military forts or garrisons, not general populations that include, include women and children. So what was really being attacked was not the entire city, was not all the inhabitants of the city, but just the military. There's no archaeological evidence of civilian populations at Jericho or AI, so they didn't even exist at Jericho or AI. There was only a military setup at Jericho and AI. Given what we know about Canaanite life in the Bronze Age, Jericho and AI were military strongholds. So that's what was attacked, the army. In fact, Jericho guarded the travel routes from the Jordan Valley up to the population centers in the hill country. It was the first line of defense at the junction of three roads leading to Jerusalem, Bethel, and Orba. That means that Israel's wars here were directed toward government and military installments. This is where the king, the army, and the priesthood resided. The use of women and young and old was merely stock ancient Near Eastern language that could be used even if women, young and old, weren't living there. The language of all men and women at Jericho and Ai is a stereotypical expression for the destruction of all human life in the fort, presumably composed of, entirely of combatants. So again, the, the, the bravado language, the, mili the, the destruction language is limited to the combatants. This is warfare. This is not just um, indiscriminate massacre like I think... Uh, like I think the subheading either of this chapter or or some of the others is. This text doesn't require that women and young and old must first have been in those cities. This, the term city, Ur, reinforces this idea. Jericho, Ai, and many other Canaanite cities were mainly used for government buildings and operations while the rest of the people, including women and children, lived in the surrounding countryside. The Amarna letters, which were written in the 14th century B.C., which were correspondence between Egyptian pharaohs and leaders in Canaan and the surrounding regions, these Amarna letters reveal that citadel cities or fortresses such as Jerusalem and Shechem were distinct from and under the control of the population centers. Again, all the archaeological evidence indicates that no civilian populations existed at Jericho, Ai, and other cities mentioned in Joshua. Other biblical evidence of various cities used as fortresses, citadels, or military outposts also exists. And there are a couple of biblical examples here. Pause the video if you want to look at those. This uh, fact is made all the more clear by an associated term, melech, which means king. The word was commonly used in Canaan during this time for a military leader who was responsible to a higher ruler off-site. What's more, the battles in Joshua do not mention non-combatants, uh, such as women and children. Now, we'll look at Rahab later. Um... According to the best calculations for Canaanite inscriptions and other archaeological evidence, um, uh, there, no, there were no artifacts or prestige ceramics uh, indicating wealth or social status as one would expect in general population centers. Jericho is a small settlement of probably 100 or fewer soldiers. That's why Israel could circle it seven times and then do battle against it on the seven day, 
seventh day on this excuse me on the same day yeah that that's why israel could circle jericho seven times and fight jericho on the same day because it was small on, as a side note we could add that translating the number used in warfare accounts in the old testament can be tricky the number simply may not be as high as what typical translations indicate the hebrew word aleph uh, commonly rendered thousand, can also mean unit or squad without specifying an exact number. So if Jericho were a fort, then all those killed therein were warriors along uh, with political and religious leaders. Rahab and her family would have been the exceptional non-combatants dwelling within this military outpost. The same applies throughout the book of Joshua. While the biblical text mentions specific kings or military leaders who were killed in battle with Israel, it does not mention specific non-combatants were killed. The cumulative case suggests quite the opposite of what we were taught in Sunday school. In addition, Saul's destruction of the Amalekites could have been a similar scenario. The target could simply have been fortified Amalekite strongholds, not population centers. Again, the sweeping words all and young and old and men and women were stock expressions for totality, even if men and, men and women were not present. This point is further reinforced by the fact that the Amalekites were far from annihilated. As we've already seen, the, Amal the Amalekites appear within every, excuse me, as we've seen, the Amalekites appear within the very book of 1 Samuel and well beyond. Now let's look at Rahab the tavern keeper. Earlier Copan said, we'll get to Rahab later. Here we are. Why didn't the two Israelite spies hang out at the harlot's palace? Doesn't this sound just a little fishy? On closer inspection, we can safely conclude that Rahab was in charge of what was likely the fortress's tavern or hostel. Rahab did not run a brothel, though these taverns were sometimes run by prostitutes. Traveling caravans or royal messengers would commonly stay overnight at such places, such as this tavern run by Rahab during this period. Amurabi's code parallels what we see in Joshua 2, complete with a female in innkeeper. Uh, looks like Hammurabi's code says, if conspirators meet in the house of a female tavern keeper and those conspirators are not captured and delivered to the court, the tavern keeper shall be put to death. Furthermore, such reconnaissance missions were common in the East. An innkeeper's home would have been an ideal meeting place for spies and conspirators. Such places notoriously posed a threat to security. Because of this, the Hittites in Turkey and northern Syria prohibited the building of an inn or tavern near fortress walls. But what about the idea of a sexual liaison? The book of Joshua goes out of its way to state that no activity like that took place. The text says the, stied, the spies stayed there, not that they stayed with her. And it says they came into the house of Rahab, not that they went into Rahab, which would, which was the Old Testament euphemism for sexual intercourse. Consider Samson, by contrast, who saw a, a harlot and went into her. That's definitely clear uh, uh, sexual uh, reference in Judges 16, verse 1. The Old Testament doesn't recoil from using such language. We just don't have any sexual reference here when it comes to Rahab. Instead, the book of Joshua depicts Rahab as a true God-fearer. Uh, yet, such taverns in the ancient Near East would draw people seeking sexual pleasure, but this doesn't apply to the Israelite spies who visited there because it was a public place where they could learn about the practical and military dispositions of the area and could solicit possible support. Now we'll look at the Canaanites' refusal to acknowledge the one true God. Unlike Rahab and her family, her fellow Jerichoites and most of the Canaanites refused to acknowledge the one true God. The example of Rahab and her family, and to some extent Gibeon, reveals that consecration to the ban wasn't absolute and irreversible. God was, as we've seen, more concerned about the destruction of the Canaanite religion and idols than he was the destruction of the Canaanite peoples. God repeatedly expresses a willingness to relent from punishment and preserve those who acknowledge, it, who acknowledge his evident rule over the nations. If, if the Canaanites would turn from their idolatry, would turn from their child sacrifice, would turn from their idolatrous practices, their false religion, if they would turn from these things and turn to the one true God, God would not have to punish them. For those demanding, if God exists, let him show himself, it doesn't get much more dramatic than the Red Sea parting. The creator and God of Israel had made headlines in Canaan. They knew about the miracle of the Red Sea. 
In the words of Rahab, we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. When we heard of it, we when we heard of it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He's God in heaven above and on earth beneath. In the words of the Gibeonites, your servants have come from a very far country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we've heard of the report of Him and all that He did in Egypt. Just as a pagan Nineveh repented at the sight and message of the beached and bleached prophet Jonah, the Canaanites could have repented, unless, of course, they were far too gone morally and spiritually. In the New Testament, Jesus asserts that without a willing heart, a person will not turn to God even if someone rises from the dead. The repeated visible pounding of Egypt's gods could have prompted the Canaanites to turn to the one true God, given uh, they had a heart condition like Rahab's. Yeah, if they would have been uh, responsive to uh, the knowledge of the God of Israel that they had uh, been exposed to, if they would have been responded, if they would have responded to whatever revelation they had, whatever knowledge they had, God would have given them more knowledge to the point where He could have uh, received them uh, should they have expressed saving faith in Him, in Yahweh, the God of Israel. So, uh, even Israel's sevenfold march around Jericho exhibited a formal opportunity for its king's soldiers and police and priests to relent. Yes. Um, God's uh, grace is shown in the opportunity he gives people to respond to him. People who live 80, 90, 100 years uh, without uh, faith in him, God is being merciful and gracious and extending mercy to that 100-year-old while he continue, he or she continues to spit in that God's face. Uh, God was extending grace to the Roman soldiers uh, who whipped Christ and put nails through his wrists and through his Achilles. Uh, he, Christ was perhaps uh, upholding them by the word of his power while they were doing that to him. As he was hanging on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. People there were, who were hearing this while they were mocking him heard him say that. And he is giving them an opportunity to relent today. You're hearing this and you're mocking because of the responses to these to these passages. And you've made your mind up uh, that, that this God has to be a moral monster. He can't. Uh, be the the kind of God that the Christian makes him out to be because of these passages in the Old Testament. He's giving you an opportunity as you listen to my voice. To uh, today, as you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. But if you'll humble yourself and uh, cast your cares on Him who cares for you, if you humble yourself, He will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, He will humble you. What's it going to be? The Hebrew word, nakap, which means to circle or march around in Joshua chapter 6, involves various uh, ceremonial aspects, including a ram's horn, sacred procession, and shouting. The word is found in Psalm 48, where it says that they walk about Zion and go around her. They counter towers and consider her ramparts. The word suggests the idea of conducting an inspection. In the case of Jericho, the inspection was conducted to see if the city would open its gates. The city, however, refused to open its gates. Each time the Israelites circled the city meant an opportunity for Jericho to, to evade the ban. All they had to do was open the gates and they wouldn't have to be dist uh, conquered. Sadly, each opportunity was met with Jericho's refusal to relent and refusal to acknowledge Yahweh's rule. Let's look at Israel's warfare methods. We've discussed Richard Dawkins' flawed claim that Israel engaged in ethnic cleansing. Uh, those bloodthirsty massacres carried out with, xenoph with xenophobic relish. Uh, Dawkins' um, flowery words. A review of Israel's warfare methods reveals something very different than what Dawkins paints. Israel's army simply didn't act like a horde of bloodthirsty, maniacal warmongers. For one thing, the aftermath of Joshua's victories are featherweight descriptions in comparison to those found in the ancient in the annals of the ancient Near East's major empires. The Hittite and Egyptian, Aramean, Assyrian, Babylonian, uh, Persian, or, or Greek. Um, unlike Joshua's brief four-verse description of the treatment of the five kings, 
Assyrians exulted in all the details of their gory, brutal exploits. The Neo-Assyrian annals of Asher, uh, Asher, Asherpal the second take pleasure in describing the flaying of live victims, the impaling of others on poles, and the heaped-up bodies for show. They boast of how the king mounted uh, bodies and placed heads into piles. The king bragged of gouging out troops' eyes and cutting off their ears and limbs, followed by his displaying their heads all around the city. Second, a number of battles Israel fought on the way to and within Canaan were defensive battles. The Amalekites... Uh, first attacked the traveling Israelites, so the Israelites defended themselves. The Canaanite king of Arad attacked and captured some Israelites, and the Israelites defended themselves. The Amorite king Sihon refused Israel's peaceful overtures and attacked Israel instead. So Israel defended themselves after their attempt, after Israel's attempt at making peace with the Amorite king Sihon was rebuffed. Bashan, king of Og, came out to meet Israelite, uh, Israel in uh, battle. That's Numbers chapter 21, Deuteronomy chapter 3. Uh, Israel responded to Midian's calculated attempts to lead Israel astray through idolatry and immorality. Five kings attacked Gibeon, which Joshua defended because of Israel's peace pact with the Gibeonites. Besides this, God prohibited Israel from conquering other neighboring nations. These nations were Moab and Ammon, as well as Edom, even though they had earlier refused to assist the Israelites. Land grabbing wasn't permitted by God, and Israel had no right to conquer beyond what God had sanctioned. Third, all sanctioned Yahweh battles beyond the time of Joshua were defensive, including Joshua's battle to defend Gibeon. Of course, while certain offensive battles took place during the time of the judges and other David and under David and beyond, these are not commended as ideal or exemplary. We've also seen that fighting in order to survive wasn't just an adventure, it was a way of life in the ancient Near East. Such circumstances weren't ideal by far, but that was the reality. Now let's look at the Midianites from Numbers chapter 31. As with Israel's lifelong enemies, the Amalekites, the Midianites, also posed a ther uh, serious threat to Israel. Whereas Amalek endangered Israel's very existence, Midian profoundly threatened Israel's spiritual and moral integrity as the people of God. With the help of a devious pagan prophet Balaam, the Midianites devised a plan to lead Israel into pagan worship. This involved ritual sex, feasting before Baal, and bowing and sacrifice to Baal. Bowing and sacrificing to Baal. Uh, when, uh, let's see... When Balaam couldn't bring a curse down on Israel, he sought another way. This is why Moses gives the command, uh, Now kill all the boys and kill every woman that slept with a man, but save yourselves every girl who's never slept with a man. This command must be understood in the context of Numbers 25. At Peor, the Midianite women deliberately seduced the Israelite men into orgiastic, orgiastic adultery as well as Baal worship. The death sentence for all males is unusual. However, Males were the potential enemy army to rise up against Israel. So keep in mind that the Israelite males who participated in the seduction were also put to death. Midian's brazen, evil intent to lead Israel astray called for severe judgment. God wants, uh, it doesn't want uh, his people to be led astray into false worship, and he's looking to protect his people from corrupting influence. The intent of Moses' command was to undermine any future Midianite threat to Israel's identity and integrity. What about, taking the, what about the taking of young virgins? Some critics have crassly suggested that Israelite men were free to simply grab and rape young virgins. This was not so. The young virgins were saved precisely because they hadn't degraded themselves by seducing Israelite men. As a backdrop, have a look again at Deuteronomy 21. There, a Gentile female prisoner of war couldn't be used as a sex object. She could not be used as a sex object. An Israelite male had to carefully follow proper procedures before she could be taken as a wife. In light of the highly sensitive nature of sexual purity in Israel and uh, of Israel's soldiers' specific protocols, let, let's, see, let's do this one again. In light of the highly sensitive nature of sexual purity in Israel and for Israel soldiers, specific protocols had to be followed. Rape was most certainly excluded as an extracurricular activity in warfare. 
Uh, now let's look at making offers of peace first. In light of Deuteronomy 20's uh, warfare procedures, many scholars argue that Israel was to offer terms of peace to non-Canaanite cities, but not to Canaanite cities. This is the majority view, to be sure. However, others, including traditional Jewish commentators, have argued that the destruction of Canaanite cities was not unconditional and that treaties could have been made under certain conditions. As with Gibeon, despite being sneaky treaty makers, a straightforward peace pact could have been available for any Canaanite city. As we saw with Jericho, the seven, a sevenfold opportunity was given for Jericho to make peace with Israel, which it refused to do so. Consider Joshua chapter 11, verse 19. There was not a city which made peace with the sons of Israel except the Hivites living in Gibeon. They took them all in battle, end quote. Like Pharaoh who opposed Moses, these Canaanite cities were so far gone that God simply gave them up to their own hardened, resistant hearts. Again, the primary focus in passages like Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 20 is on Israel's ridding the land of idols and false destructive religious practices. The ultimate goal isn't eliminating persons, as the inspection march around Jericho also suggests. Now let's look at driving them out. What adds further interest to our discussion is the language of driving out and thrusting out the Canaanites. The Old Testament uses language of dispossessing the Canaanites of their land in those passages uh, listed there. Um, let's see, it says in Exodus chapter 20, 27, let's see, he says, um, Little by little, I will drive out the Canaanites uh, from before you, he says. And the hornets will drive out the Hivite Canaanite and Hittite over a gradual process. So driving them out gradually or dispossessing them is different from wiping them out or destroying them. Expulsion is in view, not annihilation. Just as Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, or Cain was driven out into the wilderness, or David uh, was driven out of Israel by Saul, so the Israelites were to drive out or dispossess the Canaanites. The Israelites were to dispossess the Canaanites. The Old Testament uses another term as well, where it says to send out or cast out. This sheds light on the Canaanite question. Just as Adam and Eve were sent out from the garden or cast out from the garden, so God would send out or cast out or drive out the Canaanites. And upon examination, the driving out references are considerably more numerous than the destroying or annihilating references. Annihilating references. You, uh, you see more references to driving them out than you see references to destroying them or annihilating them. In fact, the verbs annihilate or perish and destroy aren't all that the critics have made them out to be. The verbs that actually mean to annihilate or perish or destroy aren't all that the critics have made them out to be. For example, God threatened to destroy Israel as he did the Canaanites. How? Not by literal obliteration, but by removing Israel from the land to another land. Both verbs are used in Deuteronomy chapter 28, where it says in verse 63, it shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you, prosper you and multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you'll be torn from the land where you're entering to possess it. Even when Babylon destroyed the city of Jerusalem, all cooperative Jews were spared. In short, fleeing Canaanites would escape. Only the resistant were at risk of actually perishing. This brief examination of terms uh, connected to the, uh, to the Yahweh Wars yet provide, um, provides yet further indication that other, utter annihilation wasn't intended and that escape from the land was encouraged. How then does this dispossessing or driving out work? Well, it's not hard to imagine. The threat of a foreign army would prompt women and children, not to mention the population of, of, at large, to remove themselves from harm's way. They would, they would run away and evacuate because they were escaping for their lives. The non-combatants would be first to flee. Well, that makes sense. They're not going to be putting up a resistance, so they're going to want to get away from the danger. As John Golden Gate writes, an attack population wouldn't just wait around to be killed. Only the defenders, the military, the army who don't get out are the ones who would get attacked and would get killed. They're there to be killed. The evacuees, the non-military, they left. They wouldn't get killed. As Jeremiah 4.29 suggests, um, at the sound of 
the horsemen every bow, uh, and bowmen every city flees. They go into the thickets and climb among the rocks. Every city's forsaken. No man dwells among them. Again, the biblical text gives no indication that the justified wars of Joshua were against non-combatants. We read in Joshua and in Judges that despite the obliteration language, plenty of Canaanite inhabitants who were not driven out were still living in the areas where Israel settled. Moreover, Canaanites in general were to be displaced, driven out, not annihilated. Then there's the passage or passages that say Joshua utterly destroyed them just as Moses commanded. In the following text, Joshua's utter destruction of the Canaanites is exactly what Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Uh, Joshua 11, verse 12. Joshua captured all the cities of these kings and all their kings, and he struck them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed them just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. That's Joshua 11, verse 12. Uh, then Joshua, a couple verses later in Joshua 11. All the spoil of these cities... And the cattle the sons of Israel took as their plunder, but they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. They left no one who breathed, just as the Lord had commanded Moses his servant. So Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did as he left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Joshua chapter 11, verse 20. We're staying in chapter 11 here. That he might destroy them just as the Lord commanded Moses. So there's three examples of just as the Lord commanded Moses. Uh, remember, Moses' sweeping commands to consume and utterly destroy Canaanites and not to leave alive anything that breathes. Joshua's comprehensive language echoes that of Moses. Scripture clearly indicates that Joshua fulfilled Moses' charge to him. So if Joshua did just as Moses commanded, and if Joshua's described destruction was really hyperbole, common in ancient Near Eastern warfare language and familiar to Moses, then clearly Moses himself didn't intend a literal comprehensive Canaanite destruction. He, like Joshua, was merely following the literary convention of the day. Now let's look at scripture and archaeology. With its mention of gradual infiltration and occupation, the biblical text leads us to expect what archaeology has confirmed, namely, that widespread destruction of these Canaanite cities did not take place and that gradual assimilation did take place. Widespread destruction of these cities did not take place and gradual assimilation did take place. Only three cities, citadels, or fortresses, as we've seen, were burned. That's Jericho, Ai, and Hazor. Yes, these were these were fortresses that were burned uh, in Joshua 6, Joshua 8, and Joshua 11. All tangible aspects of the Canaanite culture, buildings and homes, would have, would have remained very much intact. This makes a lot of sense if Israel was to settle down in the same region. There would be a lot less cleanup if they hadn't destroyed everything. Furthermore, if we had lived back in Israel in the late Bronze Age in, the, in 1400 to 1200 BC and looked at an Israelite and a Canaanite standing next to each other, we wouldn't have seen any noticeable differences. They would have been virtually indistinguishable in dress and homes and tableware and pottery and even in language. This shouldn't be all that surprising as the Egyptian influence on both these peoples was quite strong. What's more, Israel itself was not a pure race. For example, Joseph married an Egyptian woman, Asenath, who gave birth to Manasseh and Ephraim. A mixed multitude came out of Egypt with them, and other Gentiles like Rahab could be readily incorporated into Israel by intermarrying if they were willing to embrace the God of Israel. So, how might the Israelites distinguish themselves? Typically by identifying their tribal or village and regional connections. For example, Ehud, the son of Gera the Benjamite, Isban of Bethlehem, and Elon the Zebulonite. Once again, or excuse me, on the religious front, again, the scriptures lead us to expect what archaeology supports. Yes, like the Canaanites, the Israelites sacrificed, had priests, burned incense, and worshipped a shrine, worshipped a shrine, which was the tabernacle. And uh, though the Israelites were called uh, to remain distinct in their moral behavior, theology, and worship, they were often ensnared, ensnared by the immorality and idolatry of the Canaanite peoples. For example, Israel, mim Israel mimicked the Phoenicians' notorious practice of ritual infant sacrifice to the Baals and Asherahs and to Molech. However, archaeologists have discovered that by 1000 BC, during the Iron Age, Canaanites were no longer an identifiable entity in Israel. Copan assumes that the exodus from Egypt took place sometime in the 13th century. 
Around this time also, Israelites were worshiping a national god whose dominant personal name was Yahweh. An additional uh, significant change from the late Bronze Age was that town shrines in Canaan had been abandoned but not relocated elsewhere, say, to the hill villages. This suggests that a new people with a distinct theological bent had migrated here, had gradually occupied the territory, and eventually became dominant. We could point to a well-supported parallel scenario in the ancient Near East. The same kind of gradual infiltration took place by the Amorites who had moved to Babylonia decades before 2000 BC. Hammurabi himself was an Amorite who ruled Babylon. They eventually occupied and controlled key cities and exerted political influence, which is attested by changes in personal names in the literature and inscriptions. Babylonia's culture did not change in its buildings, clothing, and ceramics, but a significant social shift took place. Likewise, we see the same gradual transition taking place in Canaan based on the same kinds of evidence archaeologists typically utilize. We're reminded once again to avoid simplistic Sunday school versions of how Canaan came to be occupied by Israel. Now let's look at a summary. Let's summarize some of the key points in this chapter as we bring it to a close. The language of the consecrated band, the harem, includes stereotypical language. All, young and old, men and women. The band could be carried out even if women and children were not present. As far as we can see, the biblical harem was carried out in particular military or combatant settings with cities and military kings. It turns out that the sweeping language of the band is directed at combatants. The band language allows and hopes for exceptions like Rahab. The band is not absolute. The destruction language of the ancient Near Eastern warfare and the Old Testament is clearly exaggerated. It's hyperbole. Groups of Cantonite peoples who apparently were totally destroyed were still around when all was said and done, like you see in Judges chapter 1. The greater concern was to destroy the Canaanite religion, not the Canaanite people per se, which is a point worthy of elaboration, as we will do in the next chapter, as Copan will do in the next chapter. The preservation of Rahab and her family indicates that consecration to the ban uh, is absolute and reversible. Let's see. God had given ample indications of his power and greatness, and the, uh, and the Canaanites could have submitted to the one true God who trumped Egypt's and Canaan's gods, sparing their own lives. But if they didn't, then... Whatever came to them did not come without fair warning. The biblical text, according to some scholars, suggests that peace treaties could be made with Canaanite cities if they chose uh, such peace treaties, but none, except Gibeon, chose the peace treaty. The offer of peace was implicitly made to Jericho by the marching around. The biblical text contains many references to driving out the Canaanites. The clear, to clear away the land for habitation did not require killing. Civilians fled when their military strongholds were destroyed and soldiers were no longer capable of preserving them. From the start, certain more cooperative Canaanites were subjected to forced labor, not annihilation. This was another indication that the ban was not absolute. Joshua carried out what Moses commanded, which means that Moses' language is also an example of ancient, of ancient Near Eastern exaggeration. Moses did not intend a literal, all-encompassing extermination of the Canaanites. The archaeological evidence nicely supports the biblical text. Both of these point to minimal, observable material destruction in Canaan, as well as Israel's gradual infiltration, assimilation, and eventual dominance there. We have many good reasons to rethink our paradigm regarding the destruction of the Canaanites. On closer analysis, the biblical text suggests that much more is going on beneath the surface than obliterating the Canaanites. Taking the destruction of anything that breathes at face value needs much re-examination. That concludes chapter 16 of uh, Paul Copan's Is God a Moral Monster, where we make sense of the Old Testament God. Next time, we're going to look at uh, the next part of the Canaanites. And so thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you find it available, please consider supporting this ministry by purchasing the published work, the 30-volume chapter on the Book of Psalms, Pinnacles and Plateaus, Meditations with the Psalmist. If you don't see it available online, please contact me directly if you'd like uh, a copy. Please pray for this ministry. The people would find it that uh, people who don't mind uh, listening to an audio book, which this basically is what this amounts to be, uh, that they could look at these points that Copan raises with an open mind, that they might uh, turn from their uh, ways and embrace the, the God of the Bible.
who sent his son, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, at the fullness of time to die and be a propitiation for their sins. So thank you again, and I hope you have a blessed rest of your day.